If the last two years hasn't waken you up, I don't know what's going to do it. Here's a quote from a book I'm reading. Bitcoin, 21 million divided by everything. Fear is critical to politicians since fear can justify all means and control in the frightened public's eyes. Wars are being waged against invisible enemies to keep the population fearful. Terror, drugs, poverty, climate change, viruses. Fighting a war against any of these phenomena is a fool's errand. The only thing such wars can lead to is more government control. I've seen it all. I remember in high school, the Iraq war was going on. I've seen the 2020. I've seen the 2008 uh, crisis. I've seen the war and terror from 9-11 and all that. And it captures the public's attention. And then media and the government use it until people get over it. Then they knew, need some new boogeyman to keep them occupied. And they know this because the numbers show this. The ratings show this. And now with the algorithms and the data that we can get, the data shows this. So what is it? It's a constant fear hype cycle. It's I'm coming up for election or re-election. What's going to get me the most hype, the most attention? What can I yell out? Who can I blame? You know, what boogeyman can I create so that I get a bunch of attention as the savior and protector from said boogeyman or thing? Now, we're going to see this coming up hardcore in the midterms, especially re-election. We're going to see inflation being blamed on things. We're going to see a Bitcoin being attacked. We're going to see, you know, maybe student loans going to be a thing, although I think they're overestimating that because a lot of voters, there's way fewer voters that are concerned about student loan than there are the few that want the forgiveness or whatever. And I want to get into the absurdity of that, but we're going to see more and more of this. What's fascinating about what's going on right now is we're experiencing decentralization. We are coming from a world that was peak centralized. It was America, was the dominant superpower, and we had control of the narrative, we controlled the media, and people went to the government, the state, politicians, and the media for their information. And now with the internet, we've had information that has been decentralized. You can get information at the speed of light, immediately, in real time, 24-7, and attempts to censor actually backfire because of the more and more connected nature and the more and more decentralized nature of information sharing the internet which is why all their attempts to censor backfiring hardcore and now swinging the other direction. I mean, look, Elon Musk literally bought Twitter, one, point, one of the most influential platforms online when it comes to politics and narrative. That was no coincidence. These are just things that are happening. This is the market responding. And if you read The Sovereign Individual, the book, or at least read the thesis of it, because the book itself is a little dry, they predicted this. They predicted some kind of internet money. They predicted that uh, information would be decentralized and that would lead to a toppling of a lot of the, you know, the state, the control, dictators, et cetera, that have used their positions of power and their monopoly on the narrative and their, their monopoly on broadcasting to stay in power and to keep the public afraid, docile, paying their taxes and not causing a ruckus. What they predicted is that the internet and the ability to share information would remove that power. And they predicted something like Bitcoin, some kind of internet money, but they didn't really, they couldn't have foreseen just how powerful Bitcoin would be. Bitcoin literally demonetizes violence. It's a completely new paradigm. It's going to be the base layer for human civilization. It is a decentralized technology. It's just like the internet when it comes to speech. It is money through decentralization, through mathematics, and through trustless protocols based on opting in rather than coming down as an edict from some higher sovereign power. It brings sovereignty to every holder, to every human on the planet. And we're not out of this. We're going to probably have another 10 years, maybe 20, of really crazy turmoil. Now, I suspect that we will have a much softer landing. Like if this stuff was happening a while ago, out these technologies that we could fall back on without the ability to, if the dollar collapses, move to Bitcoin and some of these other crypto assets as a way to kind of soften the blow. If we didn't have that, I mean, we'd be talking about potentially some major apocalyptic scenarios where if the money collapses, everything else collapses. Every state, every government, every 911, every police, every fire. And then what would happen is gangs would rise up and those willing to use violence to get resources would become the new power players. And if you didn't have protection, you wouldn't have anything. <laughs> People in a modern environment, especially America, misconstrue the relative stability around them that they've lived in their whole lives. They misconstrue that for permanence. They believe it will always be there. But there's absolutely no reason whatsoever why you should ever think that. And if you look through history, that's never been the case. Everything that rises up, that centralizes, and that includes safety, prosperity, you know, whether it's Rome or every other civilization in the history of the planet Earth has crumbled, has wasted away, has returned to entropy. Most modern humans believe we live in a post-history world where history was something that happened before and it no longer happens. But that's not the case either. History happens every single day. They're going to write about 2020. They're going to write about maybe 2028, 2030, whatever the next big major thing is. They're going to write about this in history books. It's going to be a curriculum that a future student has to understand, offer their opinion on, write papers about, etc. 
maybe they'll be writing about World War III. Who knows? The thing to keep in mind is the likelihood of that happening, of, of something major happening based on math, based on history, is probabilistic. It is likely to happen. And this is where I think we get confused with recency bias and what we've grown up in. We believe that things will stay the same. We cling to the status quo. We cling to the way things have been and we put our head in the sand, even when the sign's pointing to change, even when things get really tumultuous. Most people just stick their head in the sand and they try to ride it out. Because again, what could people do? What can you do? If you don't have the resources, you can't leave, you stay where you're at, you just hope they don't pay too much attention to you. Get on the trains like the Jews did, hope for the best. And students of history know how that goes. Personally, we'll leave. If things get really bad in America, we'll leave. We'll go to a Caribbean island. We'll go to another country. Wherever we will be treated best and be most safe, we will go. And Bitcoin allows us to do that. That's something that nobody can take from us. No government can censor it or take it away or prevent it. It is the only form of uncensorable money, unconfiscatable money, unmanipulatable money, value, energy that humanity has ever seen. And what that does is it removes the power of the state because when citizens can move freely and especially when they can move their financial energy, their sovereignty, their wealth, when they can move that and a government cannot keep them from doing so, then free market forces and game theory come into effect. Then people can simply leave America or wherever it is if they're being treated poorly. And what that does is it puts a mechanism in place that makes it so governments have to pay attention to the wants, needs, and desires of their citizens. Just like any company, if you piss your customers off, there's always a willing market participant that would gladly take your customers from you. That's what the sovereign individual thesis is about. It's about there's always gonna be another jurisdiction that would gladly welcome citizens and their tax revenue and their wealth into their borders if it meant they were leaving from somewhere else. The key is to stop falling for it. That's the first step. Stop playing into their game. Stop voting in a certain way because they yell and kick and scream about some new enemy. Stop being afraid. I mean, that's really probably the biggest thing. When you stop being afraid of the government and you stop being afraid of all the boogeymans that they create, you become free. You become free of mind. Your mind is untethered to the bullshit. You become a sovereign individual. And then when you buy Bitcoin and you have your passport and you have somewhat of a plan so that you'll leave if you have to, you now become a truly sovereign citizen. And if that happens, when the power is removed from the state and from centralized points of power and given to the people, we will have what the free market always creates, prosperity for all. That's what the free market does because a free market is simply humans exchanging value. If you give me what I want, I pay you, you make some money, it's a value exchange, we're both happy. When the state, which has a monopoly on violence and it doesn't have to answer to its citizens, it pretends it does, but it doesn't really, and there's not really feedback mechanisms in place, when citizens can vote by leaving and going somewhere else and the states become reliant on keeping people happy, that creates prosperity for all. That removes tyranny because the state will crumble like any, like any corporation if it doesn't serve its customers. And what you'll see as this plays out over the next maybe 50 to 100 years, probably even sooner, probably 2025, 20, you're going to see states losing power. You're going to see less of the centralized global superpower nonsense and more small city states and the ability of sovereign individual humans to go other places. The jurisdictions that are the most favorable, whether it's tax treatment, whether it's laws, whatever, the cleanest, safest, they will attract more revenue and their power and brand will grow. But the thing that will be different is people will still be able to leave and that will keep them in check and that will keep centralized power in check and keep it smaller. And it will become more of a corporation to customer type of relationship rather than a state to citizen relationship. And it will be better. The world will be better in every way. And there'll be some places that will abuse this power and they will go under, you know, and there'll be controversies and there'll be the market figuring things out. But that's true of anything. That's what every state is. I mean, look at the Holocaust. Look at what the world superpowers have done in the millions and millions, hundreds of millions dead so that a few people could run communist experiments or Marxist experiments or whatever. A smaller, less centralized system based on sovereign individual rights will be better in every single way. Not perfect, We'll take time to figure it out, but it'll be better. So just a reminder to wake up, stop playing their game, stop being afraid. Literally stop being afraid. That's the number one thing because they use fear to control you. They control how you think, how you vote, your willingness to leave, to not leave, etc. There's propaganda around other states and safety. More people migrate to Mexico than vice versa, yet they would have you believe that more people want to come to America than go to Mexico. <laughs> not true at all. It's just the difference of the demographics. Poor Mexicans want to come to America, of course, because there's more freedom there. But rich Americans want to leave and go to Mexico because they have a better quality of life and their dollars go further. 
There's negative branding around everything. And that is what happens with the state. They want you to feel that America is the best and safest, et cetera, or any jurisdiction is. And every other jurisdiction has problems or it's unsafe or whatever. The reality is it's a big world out there. And we are the minority here in America and we are losing our dominance. It's still probably one of the best places in the world to live. Uh, if you had a lot of money, there are better places. But for the average person, middle class, lower class, America is still probably one of the best places to live. And whether that remains to be that way, I don't know. We'll see. But hopefully our Constitution Bill of Rights will keep it that way. Get the Better Human newsletter over at thebetterhuman.com.